Okay, now it is time for the first session of today, organized by our one of the most collaborative organizations, Born to Global Center in Korea. The topic of the session is Global Collaborative RNDB in Deep Tech for the New Economic Paradigm. I'm sure you will find very insightful and practical lessons from the presentations of the leading experts based on their real experiences in the deep tech industry. So the session will be moderated by Mr. Sokjin Zhang. So Mr. Sokjin Zhang, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Yoon, and thank you, President Cha, for the warm uh, opening remarks. Uh, Born to Global Center is honored uh, to be organizing and hosting uh, this final session of the GSDV on Global Collaborative R&DB in Deep Tech for the New Economic Paradigm. My name is Sokjin Chang, Director of International Cooperation here at the Born to Global Center. Uh, this session today will be divided into two parts. The first part being a startup session participated by the most innovative startups from Korea and Latin America and the Caribbean. It will be followed by a second part participated by global venture capitals and chaired by our chief executive director. So keep, to kick this off this session, I would like to invite uh, His Excellency, Mr. Alfredo Bascu, the ambassador of the Argentine Republic in Korea for some congratulatory remarks. Uh, ambassador Bascu um, has been the Argentine ambassador here in Korea, promoting the globalization of Argentine companies and also promoting the bilateral collaboration between startups in Korea and Argentina. Previous uh, to his post here in Korea, he has served in diplomatic missions of Argentina in global cities, including Abu Dhabi, Berlin, Toronto, and Beijing, developing the commercial and investment area of Argentina's smart insertion strategy while maximizing the potential joint work between the public and private sectors. So please join me in welcoming His Excellency, Mr. Alfredo Basco. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, good evening for everyone. And thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this special 2021 edition of the Green Smart Development and Vision hosted by Nas uh, Seoul National University, sponsored by the Ministry of Science and ICT and Born to Global Center. We are living in challenging times that pose both threats and opportunity at the same time. Climate change has become a global concern because we understood that there is no individual solution for it. Either we overcome this together or we don't overcome it at all. That is the reason why events like the one we are attending today are crucial for our future. Without the government's efforts to protect their job market and boosting domestic consumption, the pandemic could result in a vicious cycle of income loss, demand contraction, and mass unemployment. Economic activity will not be able to return to a normal under the current circumstances. Failing to address the crisis early on may lead to hysteresis in the labor market shrinking investments and ultimately may have a bigger and longer lasting impact on the economy. For that reason, last year, the Republic of Korea announced an ambitious program called the Korean New Deal that seeks to transform the country from a fast follower into a first mover. The plan whose two pillars are the Digital New Deal and the Green New Deal aims to create jobs, build infrastructure, and set the groundwork to adapt to structural changes and to lead the global economy into the post-COVID-19 era. In the case of Argentina, our country is fully committed to the international efforts to fight climate change and to lay the foundations of a new economic paradigm. I believe Argentina can play a major role in reshaping the world not only because of their natural resources, key to the energy, energy transition, but most importantly, because of the quality of our people. 
despite the ups and downs that Argentina has experienced throughout the last years, our people kept improving their skills and creativity, which will allow them to face the future in their best possible shape. In a new, a new era has started, full of challenges and opportunities. The new economic paradigm will require new approaches, collaboration, and a lot of technology transfer. As a result, new businesses and new jobs are unfolding as we speak. The future is now, and we must be at the forefront of the transition, leading the way. Let's work for it. Thank you, and have a good event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Basku, uh, for your kind remarks and always being such an avid supporter of the collaborative uh, R&DB between Korea and not just Argentina, but Latin America. Next, for congratulatory remarks, I'm honored to present to you Ms. Irene Arias Hoffman, CEO of IDB Lab, the Innovation Laboratory of the Inter-American Development Bank Group. Irene uh, has mobilized financing knowledge connections to create experimental projects and to support entrepreneurs in Latin America and the Caribbean with potential impact. She has spent over 20 years with the World Bank Group, specifically with the IFC, the largest international development institution, and she focuses continuously here at IDB Lab on innovation, venture capitals, and entrepreneurship for impact in the region. Uh, Irene has kindly sent us her, congratulatory, uh, her keynote speech uh, through a video. So here's Irene Arias Hoffman, CEO of IDB Lab. Jonah Chim, buenos dias and greetings from Washington, DC. I'm Irene Arias Hoffman, CEO of IDB Lab, the Innovation Lab Laboratory of the Inter-American Development Bank. And I'm really happy to be with all of you in different cities connecting today at Seoul's National University second green smart development vision conference. ITB Lab uh, is a key ecosystem builder and venture investor in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, over 30 years, we have been deploying uh, funding over $2 billion in startups and venture capital funds. We have been limited partners in more than 90 VC funds and funded over 460 startups. And one uh, of our roles is to promote through financing, through connections and through knowledge um, the growth of startups as a way to not just recover Latin America and the Caribbean, but also transform it. And uh, very much uh, in the frame of the vision 2025 of the ITV group, our aim is to um, create this, these opportunities. And we believe that by connecting Latin America and the Caribbean with global ecosystems, we can accelerate this growth. Of course, partnering with Korea, um, is key for us um, as number two on Bloomberg's Innovation Index and also one of the top 20 startup ecosystems in the world. Korea is a major entrepreneurship and innovation hub that has huge potential to connect uh, with other parts of the world. And we're very, very keen to create these connections with Latin America and the Caribbean, particularly on deep tech, uh, where uh, the region is starting to emerge with very, very good talent and can benefit tremendously from connecting with Korean entrepreneurs in, in deep tech. This is why uh, in 2020, uh, with our main trusted partner in Korea, Born to Global, we've been promoting the creation and matching of deep tech startups and partnership pairs uh, across these two ecosystems. So in September 2020, we launched the Latin American Caribbean Korea Deep Tech Exchange Program. This is an initiative that is, I think, first of its kind uh, to create global joint ventures and startup partnerships between Korean and Latin America and Caribbean deep tech companies that have high impact potential and doing innovative solutions, particularly to help with COVID-19 induced problems. Um, now, five most innovative and impactful deep tech startups would be selected um, and at the end of the program, uh, five from Latin America and the Caribbean and five from Korea. Number one, uh, Reed and Maastricht uh, from Mexico and Colombia. This is an edtech and AI uh, company and um, they are developing an education platform that could lower the cost of language training and practical English licenses for professional development. 
Second, in Argentina, coconut silo and avant cargo. And this is an AI-driven smart logistics platform that can reduce paperwork and waste of empty truck movement. Third, in Colombia, a shop and company and advance. Uh, this is a fintech and big data company, and, and it's dedicated to financial inclusion. Um, fourth, uh, Dot and Wheel the World in Chile. This company brings uh, IoT to develop the tourism sector with a partnership to pro provide inclusive tour packages for physically disabled and visually impaired uh, people. And finally, fifth, uh, it's uh, Rear Next and Proximity in Peru, uh, which combines AR and VR, and it's uh, promoting remote industrial safety solutions. So congratulations to all these startups that have been selected. And uh, we are really keen to continue to foster these type of exchanges and partnerships. Congratulations for the overall event. I hope you continue to enjoy it. And, uh, and we invite you to continue to reach, to, uh, reach out to us and, and partner to build bridges between global ecosystems and Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you very much. This has been Irene Arias Hoffman, the CEO of IDB Lab, and Born to Global Center takes this opportunity to thank the IDB Lab, without whose support uh, this whole project would not have been possible. Now let us move on to the stars of the event, the startups. Uh, I would like to thank all of the startups participating today, some of them participating from as far as Argentina and Peru for taking your time at maybe not the most convenient hour uh, in your day. Uh, we will be listening to them. We'll be listening about their potential innovative solutions in the region, but also their collaborative ideas with startups in Korea. First up, it is my honor to present to you Diego Bertesolo, the co-founder and CEO of Avangargo from Argentina. Diego is the co-founder and CEO of Avangargo, a B2B trucking platform that provides carriers and shippers with better availability, traceability, insurance, and tech support. They are working closely with a startup uh, called Coconut Silo to connect their APIs to improve Avangargo's current solution for the Latin market and later creating joint partnerships. So without further ado, if Diego, if you're ready, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning there. Uh, buenas noches here in Latin America. Um, uh, I will share my screen to start the presentation. Give me just one second. Let me know if this, if everyone's seen okay. Great. Okay, so good evening again. Thank you. Good, good morning there. Thank you very much for having me, for having us with the Bancargo. Uh, I will tell you about our business and uh, the ecosystem here in Latin America in a few minutes. So I'll try to be quick and clear. So as you said, uh, we are working uh, here with the Bancargo since 2018 in the trucking business, basically focusing on the long haul on the full truck load cargo. Uh, this is a industry with a many, uh, let's say, issues to be solved, but uh, mainly focus on two, two main things. One of them is uh, empty trucks. Uh, over one third of the trucks are running empty in Latin America, basically, because uh, either they don't find uh, cargo or either they don't have enough information to, to full them up. Uh, there's a very big atomization uh, regarding carriers. Almost 90% of the trucking companies are uh, small to medium, uh, not more than five trucks, um, and basically family-based companies that uh, work as they worked 50 years ago with pen and paper and, and a, a telephone, basically. And this, this means uh, a lot of tasks being done by hand, uh, a lot of uh, unforced errors, uh, a lot of information that is not being um, used to take decisions, to make decisions, and basically a market which is in uh, regarding cargo, 
transportation is the, the biggest one in Latin America, the, the road car is uh, representing 80% of the cargo movement, but it is working as they work in the 1960s, basically. So with this in mind, we started Avant Cargo. Uh, uh, at first step, an on-demand platform solution. Um, we kick off here in Argentina in 2017. We launched in 2018, uh, basically with one idea, which was uh, start connecting in a easiest and more transparent way, uh, offer and demand. Basically unlocking access to the market and giving tools for the small and medium companies to work better. What means work be working better with basically giving them access to the market, giving them information, transparency of what was happening, where the cargo was and how to take it and giving them tools to operate in a more uh, seamless way. Um, here uh, in Argentina, in particular, in Latin America in general, um, bureaucratic and uh, issues and paperwork and things needed for moving a truck are a lot. And what we are focusing in Avanco is not only uh, in creating a digital market, but also creating tools to digitize and to uh, give more um, tools for carriers to work better, basically for small carriers. This means uh, today the biggest carrier network in Argentina, we have almost uh, 16,000 companies uh, connected and over 60,000 trucks. We enable an end-to-end -end digitization uh, from creating, from looking what where cargo is up to uh, finishing uh, a POD. Um, we provide over 20 API integrations for carriers and shippers for due diligence, for uh, connection information, for um, uh, lead monitoring, etc. And um, basically, we are optimizing the miles travel of our carriers. How do we do it? Uh, this is basically uh, work on, a, on our proprietary algorithm uh, that connects these uh, 15,000 uh, companies. Uh, we also gather information from other 30, 100,000 tracking uh, trucks in the country. And basically we take all these data points uh, in order to analyze and to predict in the best possible way where cargo is and where carriers are. So we work in that way. And that's how we started uh, four years ago, the venture. What happened next? Well, basically we, what we've seen is that uh, spot market or, or what we were doing was very powerful, but it wasn't enough to digitize the industry as we wanted. What we've seen is that never, uh, regardless how much um, do we push from our on-demand platform, there were still a lot of transactions, a lot of users that still needed basic uh, software services. So we launched it beginning of this year, um, our SaaS platform, which basically enables our users, not only carriers, but also shippers, not only to get access to the market, not only to connect with uh, offer or demand, but also to unify uh, in, in, the, in the same workflow, their own provider. So what we, we are basically doing here is combining a TMS with a open network, uh, opening the APIs uh, to the market and uh, bringing a solution uh, more universal and more powerful than only being a marketplace connecting and uh, doing transactions, uh, uh, tracking transactions. Um, basically, this means uh, improving due diligence, connecting in a faster way, but also allowing users to connect by themselves, don't needing to uh, transact over uh, or with a cargo. Regarding uh, the Build Lab and Born to Global uh, project, we've been selected uh, in this Deep Tech Exchange Partnership, which was a, a great honor. Basically, with the um, 
with the objective of developing or not developing but uh, expanding this service in other latin countries we are actually uh, opening uruguay in the next trimester and our plans is to go to chile colombia peru and mexico in the next 18 months in this way uh, not only using or, or exploring our experience uh, in latin america but benefiting uh, in a big way from coconut silos um, solutions what they've been working in the last years which are well very powerful and focus on big data and mobile solutions which are uh, some technology stacks that we've been developing here but basically not so far not so deep because of, of our of the technology stage here in the in the area so we are very uh, very excited of what will happen here our goals are basically the same we have here in argentina uh, which are improving operational tools basically for sme car sme carriers uh, giving them commercial access giving them uh, network visibility and at the end improving overall conditions uh, to the market right now uh, we are a company backed by some pretty interesting investors uh, we are very proud of uh, what we, we've been doing with them and uh, working with big customers in basically all the um, all the big industries in the region from agribusiness uh, to um, consumption uh, to well <laughs> basically construction uh, aggregates uh, we've been working basically fuels basically every industry so uh, what we are planning to do right now is to take this um, experience and hopefully scale it to latam thank you very much and we're done thank you very much uh, diego uh, this has been Diego Bertesolo, co-founder and CEO of Avancargo. Uh, our congratulations to you for being selected as a startup pair by the IDB Lab. And we wish you the best in your road ahead together uh, with Coconut Silo. Next up, um, it is my honor to invite a Korean innovative a startup company called You Like Korea. It is my honor to invite Mr. Steve Kim, a global head of legal and overseas business of You Like Korea. Uh, Steve Kim um, is working on You Like Korea, a startup focusing on the well being of livestock. They integrate AI technology and biometric data of livestock to provide valuable information and services to both farmers and consumers in order to optimally manage and care for their livestock. They are working in globally uh, countries uh, like Japan. Europe, US, and now are focusing on expanding and working together with potential partners in the LATAM region. So Steve, whenever you're ready, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's an honor to be here and to be invited to speak uh, regarding perhaps one of the oldest um, industries, and yet uh, industry that probably requires the most innovative technology uh, and data science to continue its trend uh, and its existence in terms of providing the actual original food sources uh, for the humankind. And as we have been introduced, uh, we're trying to actually infuse the actual data science uh, into the industry. And this is not meant to replace uh, their, the farmer's existing knowledge or their know-how that's been passed down to them for generations. That is something that could never be replaced. And that's very intuitive. And we actually rely on that uh, for the agriculture industry to continue to grow. But as you may see that this is 
a huge industry. In fact, before I came into uh, this industry, I really had no idea how big the single cattle industry was. There were over 1.4 billion cows in the world. And just the highlighted markets themselves uh, already have you know, close to four or 500 million cows in there. Um, and the problems exist in that the demand for such food production and now aggregated by the demand for clean food, uh, less chemicals used, less medications used, uh, traceability, uh, basically uh, people wanting to know exactly what, where the food source came from. And in order for us to actually create that environment, there are a number of things that we actually have to control. Disease, estrus, meaning that uh, when the cows need to be inseminated, delivery because cows no longer could, could give birth on their own and we categorize it as lifestyle. What are the other things that we need to actually monitor for the cattle to be healthy and productive? The Life Care Service model is deceptively simple. It's a capsule uh, product that goes into the cow. They swallow it, stays in there because they have four parts, uh, stomach system, what we call ruminary animals. And with that, the sensor will continue to emit data. They will collect data on the basal temperature, the movement activity, and the necessary GPS data to provide the most updated information to the farmers and for them to take early action if we detect any anomaly in their health status. And why is that important? We actually developed a product for both calf, the baby cows, and the adult cows because the baby cows need to be healthy in order for them to, to grow into healthy adult cows. You'd be surprised to find that you know, of the 10 baby cows or cows that are born, one to two will die from diarrhea, from pulmonary diseases, and any cows that goes through a, you know, even one or two disease cycle, they will be, should we say, less healthy uh, adult cows as well. And that actually affects productivity and basically the overall well-being of the cows in the future. So when we first started this, uh, we actually focused on getting the data necessary to run the system. So uh, even though we started back in 2012, we spent first three, four years just getting data, doing lots of POCs, doing a lot of test projects, uh, and learning how the system actually is optimized in that environment. And in, since 2018, we've developed a number of world's first uh, type of devices. Uh, devices that use LoRa technology, devices that use um, you know, other type of the 5G technologies uh, that are out there. Uh, we currently are developing a number of uh, products with SoftBank uh, and with other major conglomerates to actually make proper entry into the major market, including the Latin America as well. The screen that you see are the actual products. The one on the left, the smaller one is for the baby cows and one for the larger one is for the adult cows. The baby cow one will last about 12 months and we've designed it in a way that once they are big enough uh, to regurgitate food and go through the whole ruminary process, they will naturally spit this out. And once that happens, then we simply put in the larger one, which will last somewhere between four to five years, the lifespan of their time at the farm. And we provide overall from beginning to end a monitor of the health status for the cows. And certainly we've developed our own uh, internal web system and as well as app for the farmers to get an over, overview of what's going on with their farm and their, and their cows and the cow status on an individual basis. This is important because when they get alerted, uh, they are actually alerted in the very, very early stages of any disease or anomaly. And that's, this will allow them to take early action, which is critical. Main feature of the services, you see that disease and heat detection and optimal calving time. Number one, two, three. If they are done properly, then four, five, six, seven will fall in naturally. When you have better productivity, when you have better management, when you have cows that are producing healthier milk, when you, are, when you have cows that are actually giving birth to healthier offsprings, all of that becomes, uh, should we say, a positive aspect for the effective schedule management and farm management, which will make your farm more, you know, more productive. 
the data analysis is important. This is where the, the artificial intelligence will come in. Um, obviously, of the 1.4 billion cows, they, they cannot all be monitored individually from our office. So we, we run uh, AI that continues to learn uh, itself regarding some, some of the key diseases and key issues that need to be identified. This is why we ran test projects in Brazil. We're running one in Paraguay. We'll be running two projects in Kazakhstan. We ran one in the United States, in Germany. Uh, we're, we're fully uh, commercialized in Korea and Japan. So the amount of data that's, that's coming in into our servers, which is about 36 of them, they keep learning the system so that they could provide the necessary uh, alerts and advisory uh, to any farm in any region. Some of the, the I'll go quickly over the, the case studies. Mastitis is actually one of the key issues that you'll see on dairy cows, the milk cows. If anyone, any one of them becomes sick and you have to inject them with an antibiotics, they are now out of the milk production cycle for at least 10 days. And that actually affects the productivity of the farm. Just like the corona vaccine, cows also actually have adverse reaction to certain vaccines. And rather than actually trying to figure out uh, of the 200 cows that you have, which ones are sick, you could actually easily identify which ones are having the adverse reaction and take early action so that you don't have to give injections to all 200 cows. Calf diarrhea, as we, as we mentioned, Respiratory and digestive issues are the two biggest issues where why the baby cows die. Uh, if we could catch them early, and we are catching them early already in Japan, that they are, they are able to grow into adult and pro productive cows as well. Calvin prediction, when they're about to give birth, this is critical because they can no longer give birth on their own. 24 hours before they give birth, we give them notice, and the farmers actually then uh, put them in a separate box or a separate area where they monitor, monitor until they give birth and, and provide it with the help. Estrus detection, the artificial insemination timing is critical. If you miss that, then you have weeks of time where they are simply sitting there and not being productive. Uh, and so this is actually important in terms of the overall productivity of the farm. We are a 60 people organization. We have 30 people here in the headquarters and 30 people spread across Korea. Uh, in terms of our, our main distribution and reseller agents as well. The partners that you see on the bottom are some of the partners that we work with uh, in developing their key markets uh, today. We've spent significant amount of effort to globalize ourselves and establishing the necessary offices. The reason why we actually in incorporate independent regional offices is so for us to actually take advantage of the government programs that often offer subsidies to the farmers to offset the cost of use, using our system. We are uh, truly global, this is a global market, uh, and the number of trials that we ran uh, significantly helped our data and our AI system be, to become more accurate, which is about 98% accurate at this moment. To be more specific, the way that we work with SoftBank at this moment is that we are currently developing the CAT M1. This was actually funded by SoftBank, and we actually completed two POCs in Australia, which actually allowed us to say, okay, wait a second, something is working here, but something is not working as efficiently as we want. This is why it actually allows us to come back to the drawing board and say, okay, then let's redevelop this product uh, and make, make sure that this is optimal for us to actually run it. The upside for the SoftBank is that this will allow them to actually then have a certain sales right in the key Australian market, as well as have preference, um, as you say, a lead in time to use our other products, which we have products for the pigs, we have products for the dogs and cats, all of that uh, SoftBank will have uh, exposure, which they could actually decide whether to go in there with us or not. TDC Denmark, uh, TDC is the largest telecom communication uh, in D Denmark. While their cattle market is only 640,000 cows, they are very, very adaptive to new technologies. And the key market that we're also going after is their pork industry. Da Danish ham and Danish pork industry is, is considered perhaps one of the best uh, and most advanced market in the world. And this is why our current product for the pigs uh, is uh, suitable uh, for this market. And we are currently discussing with TDC to do this. TDC has actually assigned 
one of their consulting companies with us to, for them to identify potential POC farms and for us to actually move into uh, the market at an optimal pace. Uh, we, we will be sending a sample capsule to TDC within the next two weeks for them to do the, uh, the network testing. Once connected, then we'll start to talk about the POC and the commercialization in Denmark within the next 30, 60, 90 days. Um, our, our technology has been um, recognized and approved by a number of entities here in Korea and abroad as well. Uh, and our CEO, who, who's a PhD background in computer science, continues to write academic papers for us to validate the, our technology and our efforts as well. Um, we certainly have a number of partners, a number of contracts with both Korean and non-Korean industry as well, and we're very proud of that. Uh, and with any technology, patent is key. So we spend a significant amount of resources and time to make sure that our patents, are, are, our technology is protected wherever we go. As we mentioned, scientific papers are actually, you know, this is important uh, for the experts to recognize what we're doing and basically validate uh, the actual benefits that's delivered by our products as well. The last thing is that we're actually working on a a platform where all of this data could be you know, put into a singular module where the blockchain based uh, traceability uh, could provide to say additional layer of information to the consumers. Right now we know that there are companies that are already providing where the food came from, how it was delivered and whatnot. We could actually go back one step further and tell them when the cow was born and how it was managed, how often was it sick, you know, was it given antibiotics, all of that information. Uh, could be pro provided to the consumers as well. As we mentioned, you know, we need healthy animals for us to be healthy because it's a, it's a circle, it's a circle of life for us. Uh, and I, we believe that when animals healthy, we are certainly going to be healthier as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Steve, uh, for that uh, clear uh, and insightful presentation. This has been, again, Steve Kim, Global Head of Legal and Overseas Business of You Like Korea. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, next up, we have an innovative startup from Peru, David Alva, co-founder of Proximity. David Alva is a co-founder of Proximity, a startup using virtual reality to transform training in high-risk industries such as mining and energy. They take AR and VR technology to transform the safety aspect of trainings related to high-risk industries. They are again selected as IDB Lab well, as a potential partner working with a Korean company called Vernect to enhance the level and accuracy of that training and also potentially AR remote solutions. So without further ado, David, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, perfect. Well, first of all, um, thank you all for the invitation. It's an honor to be presenting in this event. And uh, I want to tell everybody a bit about proximity, about what we have been doing in high-risk industries, how we are developing, and um, the results we expect of our partnership with, with Burnick. First, um, about proximity, as uh, was said, we are a startup that is focused on transforming training in high-risk industries. Now, why is this? Um, basically, um, as many might know, uh, traditional training in high-risk industries works in, in two classic ways. On one side, we have uh, the traditional classroom training, the theoretical training, and you also have field training or, or practical training. Now, each of these methods have their own advantages and disadvantages. For example, classroom training, while it can be inexpensive and easy to implement, it is very well known to be uh, generating very minimal knowledge retention and motivation. Uh, this tells us that classroom training is, in effect, it is ineffective. And on the other side, we have uh, field training, which while can be engaging and dynamic, is an unfortunately expensive, it's time consuming, and above all, it can be very risky for company workers and for company assets. And thus, it makes it inefficient. And what's more, the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, had a, a terrible impact on, on this training process. And uh, we have found in particular regions like uh, in Latin America and countries like Peru, Chile, um, the pandemic has accentuated the drawbacks of both types of training methods. Uh, for example, in, in many cases, Peru is a prime example of this, field training has been suspended altogether due to safety and health regulations and restrictions. Um, 
Like I said, LATAM is largely uh, susceptible to these drawbacks uh, because LATAM is driven by extractive industries such as mining, um, and it makes it very susceptible to, to the amount of regulations that are, are put in place. Now, we believe in proximity that training should be efficient and effective, which is why we are focused on transforming how the workforce learns, practices, and improves through the power afforded to virtual reality. Now, maybe what uh, you might be asking is why should we train with virtual reality? What are the advantages? Well, first, uh, we have increased effectiveness with 10 times more knowledge retention than traditional methods. We also generate more confidence in users after going through a course of VR training. And on the other side, we have an increased efficiency with four times faster training time and uh, most importantly, zero risks involved for workers and company assets. Uh, to put it in simple terms, we offer a better training at a much lower cost. Now, this is not uh, just um, some numbers that we are putting out there. We have results to back this up and we have had measurable impact on our customer operations. For example, a Polerosa is a, a gold mining company in the north of Peru, which uh, has experimented um, for, for a long time, a high number of accidents um, for certain tasks like rock bearing, where workers have to effectively poke at the tunnel walls to make rocks fall in order to secure the place. This type of activities has generated the most amount of accidents in these operations, and they chose us to develop VR training that would help these workers understand the risks, practice the procedure, and uh, effectively reduce accidents occurring in the mine. And with this, we actually uh, measured our results of our, of our software, and we achieved a 94% reduction in the failing score in the training evaluations of these workers after implementing the software. Basically, for the amount of people we trained, uh, we had like 17 workers that were um, having failing score or substandard performance, as they put it. And in the end, after our training software, just one worker continued with these results. So amazing results, uh, of course. And on the other side, we have MMG, which uh, is using our software to completely replace the practical field training that they used to have in a pre-COVID era. Um, they are now certifying and approving workers to um, perform their tasks using our virtual reality software to replace effectively the field training that they used to perform before. And these are not the only two cases. We've worked with leading companies, leading global companies in these industries, such as Minsur and Nexa, uh, part of the Votorantin Group in, in Brazil, um, Hadbe, uh, a mining company from Canada with operations in Peru, Poedosa, like I mentioned before, and then a global energy company. Now, how exactly do we do this? We basically integrate three core components for our solution that um, what aims to do is basically allow companies to scale VR training um, within the organization because even though these kind of solutions can be implemented as pilots, um, they are not going to generate the impact necessary if they're not scalable fully in the organization. And for that, we basically join these three components. On one hand, we have content, which can be in the form of VR 3D modules, interactive modules, or 360 onboarding modules. Um, today, basically for safety training and onboarding, we also have what we call the platform features that we offer, which includes um, analytics to assess worker performance and uh, training results, um, and other features such as streaming or device management, which helps make this technology, this innovative, te innovative technology, um, have real world results and operation, um, operational smoothness, basically. And finally, we also integrate certification. Um, even though VR is a new technology, we've managed to partner with industry standard institutions in many of these countries, uh, for example, in Peru with ah, Secondly. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. We've managed to partner up with institutions such as Secondly in order to certify workers um, from, a, from a legal and compliance point of view to do these tasks by using our training. So this is a huge step, not only for, for us as a company, but also as a, a use case for virtual reality itself. So these are some of the modules we, we incorporate in our solution. We have modules for high-risk tasks such as work at heights, hot work, excavations, all of these um, tasks that apply not only to mining, but also to other high-risk industries such as manufacturing, construction, and energy. 
And here, I just wanted to share with everybody some of the screenshots of how this looks inside the headset. The worker can experience this in a completely immersive manner with full range of movement and full interactivity. And of course, this would not be complete if we were not able to measure this. Like I mentioned, we track the worker performance, helping supervisors in, in these operations basically um, understand what kind of accidents are occurring for workers, what kind of time they are taking to, to, to complete this process. Um, other variables like, such as equipment that has been taken or equipped in the, in the process. So much of this information is very valuable for companies in order to assess their company, their worker performance in these training procedures. We also have done all of this integrated for standalone VR headsets. The technology has advanced very much in, in, the, in the last few years. And uh, we believe this has only helped boost our, our ease of use and operations as standalone headsets are portable, easy to use. They don't require any smartphones or PCs um, or external sensors and above all they are wireless. And to add to this, proximity is one of uh, the few, basically, ISV op official ISV partners of Oculus in Latin America and the only one in Peru, of course. Um, as to how we deliver this to, to these industry companies, basically, uh, for the content we offer, uh, for each of our modules, each of our tasks, we offer a variety of immersive environments with fail states where workers can experience accidents, which obviously helps very much to increase knowledge retention and uh, different use modes such as learning mode or evaluation mode where we can teach or evaluate workers in these training procedures. And on the other side, we have the platform side, which grants users or companies access to the content catalog, to our training manager, to of course, software and hardware support, modifications, because we know these processes change in time and to an ongoing uh, roadmap of updates and features. As for the company in our startup, the, the, uh, the team in our startup, um, we have a very robust team of programmers, designers, 3D artists uh, with years of experience in the industry. And of course, uh, we've also worked with uh, one of our mentors, which uh, has more than 20 years of experience in mining in Canada with safety and uh, health uh, regulations in, in the mining industry. Uh, and as a team or as a company itself, we've gone through LATAM's biggest accelerators. We've been to Tech Ventures, Sala Chile, recently been admitted to an important accelerator in Canada for soft landing in that country. And of course, I'm going to talk about this in, 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 in briefly, but uh, we've recently been selected by the IDB lab for the deep tech program. Now, um, I wanted to do more of a focus into how we are collaborating with with Vernick uh, under the, the scope of the program of IDB. Basically, as I mentioned in my presentation, the Proximity is a VR training company which is helping replace how these um, training procedures in the field are, are, are conducted, avoiding workers to have to go to these uh, locations. And Vernick on the other side is one of the global leading um, startups with augmented reality remote solutions, basically helping companies uh, perform remote operations without having to transport workers to remote locations. So I want to talk about a bit some of the structural problems that uh, we had in, in, in Peru and which very much um, is, is also true for other countries in the region and how many of these have been intensified by COVID. Uh, for example, in, in these countries, um, field training is inefficient because workers are usually required to have to travel to off-site special training locations just to perform their normal training um, procedures and tasks. Um, what's more, these remote locations are not really close. Um, in, in Peru, for example, everything is very much centralized. So this means that workers have to, have to either fly to reach these places or travel by bus more than eight or 12 hours to reach because the mines and their operations are located so far off. Um, for, on the other side, uh, maintenance operations are complex. Um, in, for companies, for example, heavy machinery from Caterpillar, um, specialized experts that have to be brought into these remote outside locations because there isn't enough um, specialized talent that can do this kind of repairs when a machine, for example, breaks down. So they have to be brought in, in by emergency, basically, in order to conduct these repair operations. And both of these um, tasks are done through traditional methods. Um, Technology has not really um, 
yet been implemented at a, at a operational scale and uh, thus are expensive and time intensive, um, of course. And how has this been intensified by COVID? Basically, uh, for example, Peru is one of the most affected countries by the pandemic, uh, with one of the region's uh, second most deaths per million, and uh, as such has put uh, much travel restrictions and quarantine requirements that are impacting these industries. Workers are required to, in some cases, our team, for example, has been quarantined for one week before entering the mining operation, um, have to do several tests. So this makes traditional training uh, in, in the field or traditionally uh, mobilizing experts for maintenance very much inviolable. Now, how do we address these problems to our partnership? Basically, we are leveraging the power of emerging technologies on um, proximity side through VR and with bring through AR. And uh, we have found in our experience that companies do not view these technologies as, as um, independent um, entities, but rather they view them as part of a whole digital transformation platform. And they believe that um, VR and AR can be integrated as a, as a solution to many of these problems I have uh, uh, enumerated before. So what we are offering to them is this approach platform integration where a company uh, with these kind of problems can come to our partnership and uh, we as experts in, in this field can basically integrate the whole solution in one whole package. And uh, what we aim to offer as a value proposition is to eliminate the need for workers to finally move to other locations for operations such as training and maintenance. And this is gonna improve how uh, workers not only operate at an efficiency level, but also their safety and uh, help them upskill in order to do their tasks in a better way while helping companies reduce their costs. And what are the expectations we are looking for in this joint project? First of all, we want to have a transformative effect on customer operations, uh, where our solutions deployed. And we have to track, obviously, this through key metrics. And this is all part of the, the program. And uh, we also uh, seek to have positive and long-lasting effects on users with a key focus on low-wage workers, which conform these industries and these type of companies, and to have them generate enough skill through the use of our software. And finally, we seek to be an important benchmark for deep tech use in the region, um, obviously supported by IDB and by board to global We believe this partnership can be a benchmark for other startups in the region and, of course, for other uh, companies in the immersive technology space, which is um, very much new, but growing very fast and is in need of these kind of benchmarks in order to guide the way, uh, we hope. And uh, that would be all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This has been David Alba, co-founder of Proximity. Uh, again, congratulations for being selected as a deep tech uh, partnership, and we wish you great things ahead. Uh, last but not least, uh, I am honored to present to you Sean Park, co-founder and CEO of EnergyX, an AI-driven online energy platform expanding to global regions like Asia, Europe, and now to the Latin American region. And prior to founding EnergyX, Sean has also extensive experience as a venture capital investor in Silicon Valley and Korea. Sean, you have the floor. Um, thank you. I'm Sean from the AI energy, AI driven social energy platform provider EnergyX. Today I'm going to talk about um, what EnergyX does and how we're moving into the Latin America region for further global traction. So clean energy is, many say, uh, very difficult, complex, and expensive, but that's not true at EnergyX. Uh, we change all of that. Um, there is a, this mega trend in the energy sector, and everything's moving from the traditional energy industry, which is occupied by oil, coal, and natural gas, to uh, complete, completely electricity-driven uh, industry, which is mostly driven by renewable energy sector. Uh, by 2050, the largest share of energy consumption will become uh, an, a renewable energy. And so this is caused by uh, something called grid parity. And grid parity is when renewable energy is cheaper and more efficient than the traditional energy industry. And um, that is being realized by most countries. For example, in 2015, um, many of the European countries, as well as Germany and Japan, have uh, realized that and 
the US and most of the other parts of the Europe um, have realized that last year. And um, many of the other countries, including Korea, will be realizing this by 2025. And many of the countries, for example, uh, Korea has um, pledged to have this renewable energy ratio by 20, uh, 2040 to uh, 35%. California and Hawaii will be 100%, Germany 80%, United Kingdom 100%. And this is led a uh, pledge of uh, 120 countries and um, this market size will become more than $2 trillion by 2025. So it's a very big industry. And um, in this new market, it's very different because this whole industry is going to be a very small, uh, small scale driven industry and it's a B2C market. Um, in this market, for example, solar, wind, fuel cell, all of this is home uh, produced energy. As you can see, it's not just solar panels, but also wind and uh, fuel cell, which is produced at home. Uh, as you can see, it's just like a refrigerator and that uh, not only produces energy, but also filters the air and um, produces um, hot, hot um, uh, water. So producers are producers are also consumers and this is why we call it prosumer market. Um, this market has many problems in three different ma major arenas and in the energy supply market, the limited information and opaque market practices hinder the market from having more transactions and many owners are in danger of uh, falling victims to unfair trades and excessive pricing. And in the financial market, um, and the middlemen like credit providers, investment funds, asset managers and banks charge excessive fees between the owners of the projects and end investors. And uh, there's, this problem becomes even bigger for the financing projects pre-installation where finance, financial institutions overlook and do not deal with small scale projects. And this is a very big problem because the new energy market is mostly about small scale projects, as I had mentioned. And the market is even more difficult in the consumption market because most of the companies, most of the countries have a uh, government state-owned enterprises that um, takes monopoly of the market. And not only that, even the traditional electricity distributors, even those that are not monopoly have uh, a market that is very inefficient. And these dominate the consumption market and therefore, um, and this has not been changed since the very beginning of the energy and uh, in electricity industry. And that needs to be a, uh, needs to experience some very drastic change through this uh, new industry. And so Energy X uh, presents the transparent convenient solution to supply, finance and consume consumption in this new industry through its convenient untapped marketplace. Uh, all, mar all participants in the supply and consumption market enjoy better market accessibility, higher profitability and lower transaction fees, all leading to more transactions and market participants. Energy X also presents the rational and efficient financing solution to the existing and efficient industry by connecting project owners with the end investors directly via its online fintech platform, EnergyX opens up new energy capital market that removes all unnecessary middlemen and enables investing in small scale projects, which are more reliable, more profitable and efficient. So we started this uh, by building the first online energy supply marketplace, and it is a 100% untapped online marketplace platform. Offline procedures are replicated off online and for convenience, transparency for any consumer. So for example, if I were a homeowner that needs uh, to have solar energy produced from my rooftop, then I would simply log into EnergyX, insert basic information like the address and request for a project to begin. Then I would receive online quotes um, from EPC contractors and specifically for projects of my rooftop. And I would compare the prices and reliability and select one contractor to sign online then I can uh, monitor the installation progress all through pictures and uh, notes on this platform. So once the installation is complete and the project starts producing energy, EnergyX collects this data via RTU devices for use in big data and artificial intelligence. And such collective data allows for machine learned calculations and maximizing 
revenue and productivity for all users. Um, Energy X also provides uh, consumers with various financing options through its online securitized platform. So project owners um, may produce and may choose to raise funds from uh, the online marketplace through uh, individual investors or from financial institutions. And these deals include a variety from long-term project financing to bridge loan, equity, preferred stock, and convertible bonds, as well as the portfolio of these assets because you can um, max, uh, diversify these assets into one uh, portfolio. Um, so we have about 414 users in this um, platform today. We have uh, conglom conglomerates in Korea, as well as multinational companies from all around the world at the moment. And the project uh, is, um, has a variety of size and types and it's growing steadily, consistently at the moment and with uh, the amount becoming more significant today with a total value of $572.4 million and a total capacity of 146,000 kilowatts. And 72.2% of the projects are developed today at this platform. So Tony Seba at um, the Stanford University talked about how the clean disruption is inevitable, uh, giving way to a new era of participatory energy. And that's what we're trying to do and we have, uh, on top of this marketplace uh, and fintech platforms, Energex is developing a unique technological base, actively using the AI and uh, blockchain technology to innovate the industry. So um, a lot of people think uh, blockchain, associate that with the crypto, but that's very different. As you can see, crypto industry with a uh, market cap of uh, $76 billion dollars just for this one coin called a dodgy coin. They don't have this technology called mainnet and they don't have that secured, but we secure that technology, not for a crypto, but to have our own chain ecosystem so that we can produce um, a thing called energy X exchange, we, which where uh, we can make sure that people, uh, users can participate and exchange their PV assets, securitized assets and electricity, as, as well as the REC certificate. Um, we also uh, collect data utilizing the AI technology for operations and maintenance optimization, robo-advisory, energy investing, building energy management system, and microgrid. Um, so we're going into the Latin America to broaden our um, uh, market participants. And this is how we do it. Um, X-Chain, X-Square, x, -chain, x, -square, x is all a part of EnergyX. And uh, with X-Chain, we're providing the procurement uh, channel and X-Square, the crowdfunding platform and x for fuel cell and uh, the main platform for EnergyX. And uh, this um, platform is going to own Solaria, uh, SF Energy for a fast and broadening uh, participant, uh, which is the, they have the local subsidiary as well as uh, the affiliate partners. And um, to talk a little bit more about Solaria, it's, it's a partner, uh, it's partnered with Sunset Energy Technique and it's registered and uh, with banks and investors back in uh, Latin America and Europe. And um, SF Energy also has a vast experience of track record in the uh, energy industry and with uh, SF Energy working as a uh, offline uh, EPC contractor plat um, in the platform and Solaria working for the financing of the platform, it'll all be integrated to this one, uh, one we called um, the Energy X Latin America. And this is only a part of uh, what we do for the global sector. And we strive to change the world by going into both uh, the Southeast Asian market and European market. Um, they're all by, led by a very highly recognized and uh, very well um, uh, proven CEOs uh, of their own companies. Um, in here in Korea, uh, we're led by a group of uh, managers uh, that have a track record of success uh, in the IT industry. For example, Tom, the CTO um, uh, of our company is, uh, he is the top um, AI engineer in Korea. He's developed Bixby at Samsung, 
Uh, we have Juhi Kim, who is leading the technology sector uh, of our company. And he's, he sold multiple, he's had mul multiple exits, um, selling both companies to Kakao as CTO. I had um, experience of uh, founding a company called Bernie and Company in uh, New York, and which was funded um, $5 million. And I worked as a head fund analyst uh, at Perry Capital. And um, I was a venture capital investor before. Um, we have um, other uh, managers who have uh, had their experience both in the energy and the IT sector leading their own kind. Um, like I said, he, uh, Vladimir is also leading the European operations and Eduardo is uh, leading this Latin American operations. And we have uh, had quick growth. Um, we're only a, a two-year-old company and we have had foundations of trust, uh, which helped us to grow fast. Right now, we're the fastest growing IT company in Korea. We're selected for uh, multi-million dollars of uh, project investment. We were selected by the Korean government as a baby unicorn and uh, for Korea's best management award. And we're working with partners in the government sector as well as uh, the private sector. Um, together, we're going uh, global. And uh, we started as a supply uh, platform, calling ourselves Renewable Energy Development Platform. But we're, we have added uh, the financial platform, uh, calling ourselves Renewable Energy Platform. We're going to become a energy platform simply uh, having covered all of uh, the energy part. And uh, we have uh, so far uh, had revenue of last year, $11.4 million, and had so far funding of uh, $11.5 million. And uh, we hope to have revenue of $26.9 million by the end of this year and targeting for IPO uh, as soon as possible. So that's EnergyX and we're going global. Hopefully you guys um, uh, can uh, let me know of any questions you have. And right now we're backed by Glo uh, Born to Global as well as SNU's program. So we're very honored to have uh, such a program backing us. Thank you. Sean, thank you very much for the presentation. We will stand by you, Born to Global Center, to assist you in any way we can in your global expansion plans, which look great. Uh, ladies you. and gentlemen, this marks the end of the first part of the session. We've presented to you four future unicorns, Avancargo, You Like Korea, Proximity, and EnergyX. Um, you've heard their innovative solutions. So let us now go over to the investors and see what they think about these innovative companies. And to chair that panel session, it is my honor to introduce to you Mr. Jonggap Kim, Chief Executive Director of Born to Global Center. Over to you, Mr. Kim. Hi, good morning, afternoon, evening, and good day, everybody. Uh, uh, today, I'm uh, very excited to finally, we get the, you know, the five companies set to starting the joint venture initiative. And I really appreciate, uh, uh, you know, the Irene Hoffman, the IDB Lab CD. Uh, without the IDB Lab support, that uh, we didn't even think about the starting today's, you know, big celebration. So uh, it was, uh, uh, I, ha I had a, a 30 minute panel discussion, but uh, because of so many you know, content shared from the company, I think the maximum uh, we can have a 20 minute uh, for the panel discussion. So uh, honorably, uh, we have a great uh, panel you know, discussion people from the five countries. Australia, Argentina, Singapore, Korea, and the United States. Uh, these all investors, uh, I, I think that they already watched, you know, the uh, company's, you know, presentation. So the efficient panel discussion, uh, I'm gonna give you like a three to four minutes per each. And uh, uh, I give you a, a two, you know, the asking point, one is uh, introduce yourself or, or your company uh, briefly, and then the, what's your feedback or opinion for the presented company? Uh, do you have any uh, idea or suggestion or advice? It'll be okay. And then uh, maybe if you really wanna, as interesting to the investment, it'll be perfect. 
<laughs> I want to hear about that. And uh, if you have a little time, then I'm going to give you a separate a different question later on. So let's move in from the starting from United States, Claire Chan. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a founding partner of Ignite Excel Venture, and uh, he, she's in at, uh, you know, the Silicon Valley. So could you tell us uh, your story? Um, great. Uh, thank you for having me. And, uh, uh, you know, I commend uh, both IDB Labs and uh, Born to Global for um, really, um, you know, pulling the Latin American startups uh, uh, to collaborate uh, with uh, Korean uh, startups. I think it's, um, you know, uh, before this, I think most entrepreneurs in Korea or are in Latin America could not even think of the possibility of, you know, doing something together, right, from such different far, you know, uh, regions. So it's really wonderful to see. Um, my name's Gunnar Chang. I, uh, we're based in Silicon Valley. We are a, um, a global seed fund. Uh, we, are, we have a very specialized um, uh, investment thesis, which is uh, focusing on pre-seed seed stage companies in the um, tech-driven beauty and wellness uh, um, uh, space. And so what we mean by that is really looking through the lens of health and uh, wellness, um, everything that helps us to be well, uh, you know, uh, internally, um, mentally, um, you know, physically. And so, um, and we've, one of our very first investment actually was a Brazilian company. And so very familiar with the Latin America and the amazing opportunity the region poses. Um, I would say I, you know, congratulate all four companies uh, who presented, um, I, I mean, the, the last company, Energex, you're two, only two years old, but the, the, the amount of accomplishments that you've done is amazing. Um, um, so uh, I would say, you know, uh, keep up the great work. Um, I think it's wonderful to see how you can take one uh, sort of uh, best practice, um, a solution and, and bring it to another region. I was just having dinner last night where we're talking about the logistics issue, uh, even in Korea, very similar to Argentina. I know Brazil had the similar um, sort of uh, infrastructure, um, uh, very um, uh, segmented. Uh, and so being able to take, uh, you know, uh, one solution and being able to find that similarities and bringing best practices makes a lot of sense. Um, and again, I think as we all witnessed during COVID, you know, we are, even though we're really far away, the problems that we face, uh, we really need to come together to solve. Uh, and so I think what uh, we've seen in these four startups present gives us hope that, you know, we can really uh, collaborate and work together to solve these uh, world problems. So I congratulate all of you. Thank you, Claire. But uh, uh, I know that you, you have a lot of experience to help the foreign startups, several hundred foreign startups to, to penetrate the US market, include the global market. So do you... Can you tell me about the you know, typical challenge as a foreign startup to globalization? Um, I would say probably the most common uh, um, uh, uh, challenge or the struggle that I see is um, taking one solution from you know, your local markets and then taking it to a different region. Um, the understanding of that market and specifically the customers I think it's one of the biggest um, uh, pitfalls that we've seen. Um, so I think what you need to have is these, it's almost like a bipolar personality you have to have. Like one, you have to have this global aspiration, really big vision, think big, right? But at the same time, you need to be able to really zone in and being able to start with one customer at a time and really understanding the, 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 the uh, uh, ins and outs of that customer to fully uh, uh, bring the product uh, uh, to the level that the local markets that, that you're going after can uh, absorb. And so I think that, you know, keeping that big global aspiration, but start small, really be focused uh, and start with like one customer at a time and fully understanding it and, and, and cater your products and services. Um, and starting with that small will help you get a, you know, get a long way. Thank you for coming. <laughs> and next, uh, uh, I'm gonna ask you, Mr. Pablo Bruno, uh, co-founder of the Ventures Capital from Argentina. Uh, is it online? 
Yes, I'm right here. How are you? Good morning, <laughs> good, good afternoon. Tell, uh, share your story. Yes, I'm Pablo Quirno, co-founder of Ventus Capital, as you said before. We are a relationship-driven firm based in, in Argentina for basically in, in for all of Latin Americas, and we work together with different founders, owners, and management teams, helping them grow basically in different dynamic and sustainable industries. Um, I, I first like would like to help thank the, the National Swedish University, the Ministry of Border Global, GSDV for, for this for these conversations. Having a past myself in the public sector, I understand how difficult it is to bring these topics to reality um, and, and understand that it's now on our side, on the private sector side, to try to give these initiatives together. And, and I was saying, as, as President Chair said before, as the ambassador mentioned after as well, it's the global initiative and the global community is, is relying on different uh, stakeholders to take lead on these different topics. And I think the last year that we've seen and in this past year and a half that we've seen a huge amount of different startups have helped and solved a huge amount of humanity's problems. And I can't stress much and, and I understand and, and probably think that the rest of the panel may might agree, but the future is, is with groups like this. And, and my, my only advice, if, if I'm allowed to give to any of these four startups is take advantage of what these types of initiatives are giving you. Being able to be put on a global spectrum is not something to, to tread lightly on. Uh, it is very, very hard for us to usually find startups that are, are thinking on a global scale. And what Born to Global is giving with the different initiatives between Korea, Latin America, but, but if you look at the bigger ones, uh, with the rest of the uh, the rest of the country, it's something that being able to work together with someone that's doing something similar, but but also different, where you can learn on, is something that is a huge and amazing experience for us investors and you as, as companies as well. Thank you. But uh, uh, I know that your the Ventures Capital and uh, you already uh, experienced over three billion dollars, you know, fund management experience. So what do you think about, you know, the collaborate between Latin America startup and the Korea startup? Do you think it's uh, any advice or some constructive feedback to future collaboration between two reasons? The, the two reasons, I, I look at a more of a, I, my previous job was, was in government. Um, and, and we worked very closely together with Korea to try to have different private initiatives work together. As, as I mentioned before, I think that when you when you get together different a country like Korea with with the advancement of technology it has, um, you've seen with the four different startups that that proved before and, and showed before the immense different industries, but they're all with the same focus, which is different dynamic and technological companies. Um, in Latin America, you have different countries, but you still have the same big problem of lack of infrastructure, lack of of investments, but you have one huge advantage, which is a very strong and capable educational system with very high talented people. And that right now, due to a macro perspective, just on, on a timing wise, it is very cheap to hire very, very, very good talent in South America. Um, and I think that that is something that different investors as well as startups can definitely leverage on because I can assure you that you're going to get the same or better quality than you can get anywhere else in the world from any of the countries here in, in the region. And being able to see that with a hand-holding process as Born to Global does with different uh, future unicorns, as you guys are mentioning in Korea, to hold hands together with that is something that I think both sides can definitely learn on. Thank you, thank you for your comment. And uh, uh, today, so we invite you know Australia venture capitalist Mr. Kiel Molly. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, actually, this is a just initiative starting with uh, from the Korea and the uh, Latin America region first, but uh, we'll expand more different countries or regions collaboration for the startup. So. Uh, Mr. Pierre Mollet, could you introduce you and your company and uh, giving us some feedback? 
Thank you. And I'm delighted and excited to be here just at the start of this journey with Australia's relationship with Korea and Born to Global. Um, I'm a partner in a venture capital firm called Main Sequence. Main Sequence is the venture capital firm attached to Australia's National Science Agency. Um, that means that we're investing in companies that have science at their core that are solving very big problems for, for a planet in trouble. And one of the things that I'm excited about is how science has really reached a point where it's ready to solve some of these big problems, these impossible challenges that we talk about a lot inside our fund. And I think we've seen what is possible with global collaboration through COVID, we've seen how if people decide to do something, they decide to act, they can do something incredibly impactful. And I'm hoping we can capture this and carry on. One of the things that's really exciting to me is that COVID really smashed the walls down in venture capital investing. And that's why events like this are just so much easier than they have been in the past, where, in the, where investors once hunted only in their own geography but now we're all very comfortable meeting people in zoom and uh, and looking at amazing innovation all over the world and i think when we collaborate with people in other parts of the world it's it's a big version of hiring a diverse team we get entirely new interesting ideas because people think differently in different parts of the world and we can make ultimately much better more exciting products um, we invest very early. We're looking for things that have ambition. Um, we're looking for things where, where founders are really trying to make a leap. Um, and, um, and we think that the, the companies that succeed, su that succeed are those that have a very strong connection with a global value chain, as we've been talking about a little bit here. And it's just, it's amazing to see some of the, some of that activity that's happening in the teams that we've seen today. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm very interested the, as an Australian investor. What do you look for in the startup or founders when you invest? In? <laughs> well, well, I think the, we're really looking for people that are solving global problems. And I think that's, that's one thing which, you know, when, when we look at the sort of energy transition solutions, the sort of mass scale logistics, especially looking at what just happened during COVID and all the problems with distribution, uh, the, the, the ability to, to scale the feeding of more people um, with, uh, with the um, livestock technology that we saw this morning. I think that, that you know, solving these big global problems, I think is really exciting. But also, you know, founders that have the the audacity to think that they can do it. Uh, they're the people that we believe in. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. And the next is uh, I'm going to introduce the Mr. Fan Su, general partner at KK Fund from Singapore. Could you introduce you and your company and uh, giving us some feedback from presenting the company? Sure. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Born to Global and SNU, for hosting this uh, wonderful event. Uh, I really, uh, you know, took a lot of delight listening to the amazing startups uh, here today. Um, just to share a little bit, uh, KK Fund, we are an early stage VC based in Southeast Asia, and we're looking for innovative teams who are really addressing the fundamental problems uh, in this region. Uh, recently, we, uh, we have expanded our mandate to not just look at founders from the region, but also to expand that to global founders, including uh, teams from Korea as well, uh, that uh, are excited and are looking to uh, expand overseas uh, to solve big problems. So, so thank you again for uh, having us here today. Um, as mentioned, I'm very, very excited about the, uh, the startups uh, presented. Um, you know, there are a lot of uh, variety uh, and that, uh, you know, even on a personal note uh, to, to your point, uh, I, you know, I would be very uh, keen to speak to the startups and to explore ways to work together or potentially even invest. Um, so, so I'm certainly looking forward uh, to that. Thank you. And... Uh... Now, not only the Korean startup, but you know all 
different regions startup has a strong interest in Southeast Asia market penetration because uh, it's always uh, an emerging market and a very fast adaptive market. So uh, can you share some good advice for the foreign startup to one of willing to you know, the join in in the Southeast Asia market? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Um, my thoughts would be uh, for startups, that is, if you are thinking of expanding overseas, whether it's Southeast Asia or Latin America or anywhere else, really, um, my thought is you should focus on three elements. And if you can convince investors by showcasing these three elements, I think you'll be well on your way. And what are they? So the first element would be solutions that can be globalized, right? Because if especially you're thinking of going to a different country or a different region, um, investors want to see solutions that are relevant uh, to, to, you know, and that can be applied globally. So that's the first point. The second is a team that can be globalized. So what does that mean? That means you're able to expand your office to overseas, you're able to recruit local people, and more importantly, you will be able to establish a corporate culture that is not uh, overly reliant on uh, wherever you're from and that you are able to work seamlessly with people from different cultures and regions. So I think the second point is also very important. Uh, the third one, which is uh, uh, a little may sound a little bit different because I kept saying global, global for the first two parts. The third point is really local. What does that mean? Execution that can be localized. Because yes, it sounds great. You know, we have a wonderful global team. We have a global solution. But if you're not able to execute on a very local basis, then it's very difficult. Uh, I remember, I think Energy X, you mentioned about Indonesia. So for example, in Indonesia, um, you know, let's say if you are trying to sell your product or service uh, on a consumer basis, there are certain nuances that you will need to take into account um, and or otherwise the local, you know, behavior and habit just, uh, you know, they, they just won't, uh, uh, you know, take it and, and they won't buy it. Uh, or you need to take into account a lot of the infrastructure that, uh, uh, you know, that are present in the geography that may not be uh, uh, in Korea, for example. So I would say that these three elements, um, I would urge you to focus on that and to showcase to investors. And, you know, I will be sure if you can do that, uh, you will have a lot of interest to help you expand overseas. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in summary, the, you mentioned about, you know, the solving the global issue with the global team, but the execute locally. Yes. That's the main spirit of the, our joint venture prototype initiative. That's why we try to, you know, local to local startup, make them work together and they're solving the global issue. So you summarize very well. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> and uh, last is a uh, near side to Korea. It's a very short distance. Mr. Jung Woo Kim, <laughs> could you introduce your company and uh, uh, some giving us some feedback from the presented company? Could you turn on the voice? Mike? Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you for this conference and it's really an honor having on such a great presentations and discussion with, together with the other panels. A quality investment management company is on the traditional asset management company. We have set up the company about 11 years ago and we are managing about 800 million. But we, are, we have been investing in listed companies, the stock market, the traditional equity investment. And we set up about two years, so two years ago, we have set up a quad ventures. And all the AUM together, we are investing one third of the investment of all the AUM in the bio and healthcare related companies. And one good thing is that the for the ventures, uh, I'm not the CEO. I have been a fund manager up until March this year as a mutual fund manager. And now I'm leading the, the venture capital. And for that, for the having said that, I share the same sentiment as uh, the startup. That it's, just, it's, it's surprising that to see for companies or industries, we have seen the trucking, livestock, and, and the mining, 
And OD traditional economists can combine together with the technologists and create the value. It's really surprising. And definitely we are looking for a company with a global scale and the scalability and the large addressable market. And for, and for the, we need a, the global corporation and collaboration with the companies is really encouraging to see that. Oh, thank you for that. Uh, I know that Mr. Jung Kim is a most top fund manager when he was working to asset management, but uh, I think that the, his new starting as a venture capitalist. So, mm -hmm. uh, what, what, yeah. what's your feeling? Uh, any difficult? Is there any big difference between asset management area? Yeah, I see a really big difference. Uh, first of all, I uh, have been working as a fund manager and now as a venture capitalist. I think the 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 most distinctive feature is that. When you're managing the fund, you have a given universe. And it's something you can over, overweight or underweight your positions. And you have an option to hedge out your risk in the market or in the industry. But in VC investing, you cannot. You cannot, you cannot <laughs> put your positions. You can never. Having said that, I think uh, two principles I think we need. One is the we need a good people to invest in. Meaning that if we do good people, you can still be wrong, but I strongly believe they will learn from the mistakes and make a switch from their mistakes. There's a one big difference to manage the risk in the portfolio. And secondly, we wanna find the business of large addressable market with the scalability because the, the return distribution of the VC, I mean, probably more than 80% of your return will come from the less than 20% of positions, meaning that you have to focus and concentrate and be able to work closely with the, your, invest, your invested companies. I think that's the, the primary two differences between the traditional asset management and the VC investment. Thank you. Well, well uh, the, actually I have a bunch of the you know, talking points today. But uh, because of the, you know, the reduced our panel discussion time from the 30 minutes to 20 minutes, so, uh, I have to closing this moment. Uh, any other, thank you for the panelists, you know, from the, all the way Argentina and Australia and Singapore in the United States. Thank you again. Uh, as a startup, we just, uh, just a big step, uh, one step, uh, you know, the uh, step one from the steps on. We'll keep going on next step by step, but uh, without the venture capitalist investment, you know, the help, like a money, uh, they cannot expand, they cannot realize, make them realize their, you know, good idea to be uh, solving the global issue. So I, I wanted to, you keeping watch our, you know, the activity and uh, please support these uh, beautiful startups, you know, the, the challengeable adventure. Thank you. Thank you for that.